let's get started. Welcome everybody to our virtual gathering presented by the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. We're the statewide membership-based historic preservation organization. My name is Beverly Thomas and on behalf of the Preservation Alliance, I'm pleased to welcome you to Barn Evaluation, What Do I Have and How Do I Fix It with Ian Blackman. This program is the second in our new series called Old House and Barn Expo on the Road. Because of COVID, we've replaced our popular biennial Old House and Barn Expo with a series of over 20 Zoom programs throughout 2021, as well as some in-person events we'll be hosting later in the year. We love getting you and other Old House and Barn owners and enthusiasts together to share practical information from highly qualified presenters, make connections and offer you a dose of energy and inspiration too. Many thanks to our sponsors for making these programs possible and to all of you who are supporters of our critical work that helps to advance efforts to save and steward special places around New Hampshire. A few housekeeping points I'd like to mention before we get started. I'd like to remind you that we are recording today's session and ask you to please stay muted to keep the background noise to a minimum. You may also want to spotlight the host uh, during his presentation by choosing the side-by-side -side option under the view feature, top right-hand corner of your screen. Ian's presentation will run about 45 minutes and will be followed by a 15-minute q and I'll wrap up the program uh, by 1 p.m., but Ian has agreed to stay on for an additional 15 minutes for those who would like to continue the discussion. Uh, because of our great numbers today, we encourage you to use the chat function at the bottom of your screens if you have a question and we'll try to address those at the end during the Q&A session. Um, and before we close, we'll select a lucky winner of our Expo door prize Ian has generously offered. And now I'd like to present our speaker. Ian Blackman is a barn preservation contractor who has years of experience working with barn owners to care for and restore their historic structures. Ian established Ian Blackman LLC Preservation and Restoration in 2003 and has been a champion of barn preservation ever since. He's a graduate of the furniture making program at North Bennett Street School in Boston and worked as a preservation carpenter at Canterbury Shaker Village prior to starting his own business. Ian is an active board member of the Preservation Alliance and an exceptional ambassador and supporter of the Preservation Alliance and preservation work. Leading by example and encouraging others, he enjoys offering workshops and on-site tours, helping people understand and care for historic barns, and fostering great appreciation for these valued elements of our agricultural heritage. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Ian. Thank you very much, Ian. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I am going to uh, talk mostly about uh, the two, what I really describe, describes the two different types of barns and the problems that are uh, particular to those types of barns and how you prioritize, you know, going through the restoration um, and uh, depending on budget and, and all those other things. Um, you know, basically there are different types of barns by historic, his, you know, by when they were built, like English barns are very early barns. But as far as the problems that those barns have, um, I divide them really into bank barns and ground level barns. And um, uh, and most English barns, most early English barns are going to be ground level barns. Okay, they're not going to have basements in them. And bank barns basically have basements and have taken advantage of the slope of the ground to make that basement. Um, this barn you see in the picture is a, is a, is a bank barn um, with lots of sheds off the side of it. And um, that's one of the sheds right there. And, and basically when I, when I, when you first go and you look at a barn and you're doing an evaluation, you know, I usually start when I'm doing any kind of barn evaluation, I start in the basement or I start, if it's a house or a barn, but a lot of times what I'll do with the barns, I'll go, um, uh, and that's, you're looking at the open side of the basement of that bank barn and that's the shed off the side. Okay. Um, but a lot of times what I'll do is I'll go upstairs to the hayloft of the barn and I'll uh, uh, take a laser up there and I'll shoot a laser line. And, and then I'll measure down from a common timber throughout the barn. And, and what that does is that measurement tells me where the barn is moved in relation to each post. And, and that gives me a, a, um, a sort of starting point when I'm looking in the basement of, of what has been affecting that and what the problems are, are down there. You know? And I'll take a quick look at the, at the, uh, the, um, 
the joinery up above too to see what's what's failing. Now, right there, I'm measuring down to that that laser line and and, and seeing you know uh, and establishing. So you establish what's the highest post, you know, and what's the lowest post, and and then that gives you an idea of where the movement has occurred. Um, so there's a bank barn. So looking at that roof there. Um, we can see one of the really systemic problems of bank barns. And then you can see how um, uh, this is a, uh, a main rafter with main purlins and, 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 uh, and smaller rafters uh, roof system. And you can see in the main purlin, that's that horizontal timber um, that you see there, that there's a bow in it. So you can see that that barn has started to migrate down the slope. And that's what a lot of bank barns do. And that's one of the real uh, problem that most bank barns will have. And that's usually due to moisture uh, moving the foundation, freezing and thawing behind the foundation. And as it freezes, it exp the moisture expands and then pushes the stones and, and the barn goes with them. Uh, the good thing is that timber frames can take a lot of that kind of punishment uh, and, and still survive. Um, and, and, one of the, and, and the reason they can take that punishment is not just the joinery, but the amount of knee, knee bracing that's in there. And you can see the knee bracing in the roof there. Um, you can see, which was unusual in a lot of barns you see built from this period, which is about 1860, is you can see bracing even in the, uh, even in the uh, horizontal bracing in the, in the timbers coming across the barn, um, going down the wall system there. And, and that really adds a lot of rigidity and support to that barn moving around. Um, and this was a really, this was a really nice, nice framed barn. And once again, see so there you can see that horizontal bracing going down the length of the barn. And, and so that, that informs some of your decision making as well when you're looking at a barn is, is the condition of the barn, um, the type of framing, uh, what's unusual in it and what makes it, um, uh, what, what makes it really, really a, a wonderful barn to save. And, and, and this one really rings those, rings those bells. I mean, there are a lot of barns uh, that are built um, out of pieces of, of, of older barns. And they're built up high that way, and uh, and and sometimes their their problems are such that you look at them and you say, okay, well, you know, we'll, we'll we this might not be might not be worth that save. Um, so outside, we're looking at it. We saw that bend um, in the up above, and and um, and when I measured around, you could see I could see that some of the outside wall had dropped, and you can see the sway in the roof of uh, looking down the length of that barn. Um, uh, and so that tells you uh, the movement down the bank. And once again, you can see that dip in the into going down the length of the barn there. And that's due to the movement, but it's also due to posting in the basement and foundation issues. Okay, and so that's that side. And you can see the foundation issues. The foundation is given and started moving away, falling away from the barn. Um, and that's uh, not supporting the barn as much. So you, you can see it's supported at the corner of the barn. Uh, but the rest of it's giving away. And that's the outside wall of that shed. So it's not causing a, a tremendous problem to the barn. But if you, if you go into, you know, and there, there you can see where it's, where it's giving away. Um, but in the upper right-hand corner, you can see some concrete spattered there on the foundation. And so, you know, there's movement in also the main foundation of the barn. And right there, you can see where somebody's uh, uh, formed the out inside wall of the foundation and poured concrete against it because of movement. And uh, that's usually the very wrong thing to do. I mean, when, whenever you see concrete in a barn of, of this age, you know, see concrete in a barn, uh, it's usually a Band-Aid um, and it usually ends up exacerbating, exacerbating the problem and, um, and, and making it harder to do the fix. Um, uh, but, you know, it was one of the things farmers did at the time because it kept them, kept them moving along. So there's the basement. Um, and what do we notice about that picture? One, we notice that there's a lot of organic matter in the floor of that basement, um, and it's wet. This was uh, this was spring, uh, which is really good time to look at a barn because you can see the moisture in there. Where if it, you know if it's a summertime and it's kind of droughty, you know you can't necessarily see that. But this is very wet down there. Um, that moisture is is also offers uh, perfect habitat for powder post beetle. Um, and also raises up the moisture around the posts of the barn. We can see an old phone pole. Um, adding uh, extra support back there. Um, and so you really want to get rid of that organic matter in, in the basement or under the floor of, of any barn um, and replace it. 
So uh, in, this, that's, in this picture, we can see one, there's more posts than would be normal. Um, so most posting will be under the load bearing points of the barn, which would be under the main posts. Um, uh, you know, the, in the center aisle would be the queen posts and you'd see the posting in the basement under those queen posts. But we see a lot more posting here than would be normal. So that's an indicator of floor problems above. And, and when you look upstairs in the barn, you'll get a good indication of why those floor problems exist. But we can also see added timbers in this, in this picture. So we got some tree trunks there that are su the supports and we can see between that and the actual timber or the floor system, they've added another timber there. So we know that there's some problems there already in looking at that way that posting is. But you can also see the rod at the base of those posts. I mean, you look at this post and um, you know it's basically been wicking up moisture for a while. The bottom is rotting. You can see the rot squishing around, so you know it's dropping. Um, and this posting really needs, needs to be replaced and it needs to be on better footings than that. I mean, stones are fine for footings in the basement of a barn, but this is a fairly small stone. It's also sitting in organic uh, matter. So it, it, it's going to move a lot more. And so you really want to, those stones are fine, but they want to be sitting on basically hard pan or on, uh, on gravel and, and then they'll be fine. And also obviously no moisture around them. Uh, here we've had, we have a similar situation where we've had, we've got two posts beside each other. Um, obviously an indicator of more problems above and they've poured a footing underneath these posts when they added them in there, but it's a little four inch footing and that really doesn't, doesn't do any good. Okay, now I'm, I'm, go I'm going to one of the systemic uh, problems that's true of both bank barns and ground level barns. So there's concrete and concrete specifies, a, a, a shows a problem that, that uh, it was fixed with a Band-Aid and, and, um, and is gonna cause further problems down the road. So what you see coming out of that concrete is a floor joist going down the center aisle. You know, and, and a lot of times across the center, the uh, doorway of the center aisle of a barn, whether it be a ground level barn or a bank basement barn, um, the door is going to be open and you're going to find rot um, across that, you know, in that sill that basically joined across the queen posts on either side of that center aisle. And when that, that sill um, rotted away, um, basically most people, and you'll find this in probably, I bet you'll find this in over 90% of barns that have not been restored out there you will find concrete, a concrete apron poured, and that apron will um, uh, encapsule, encapsulate the ends of the joists, which you see in this picture, and those joists will slowly rot away because obviously concrete and wood in direct contact doesn't, doesn't mix. So how do we solve that problem? And this solution is true to, to both ground level and, and bank barns in the restoration. Um, and that depends, when ground level barns, it depends on whether you end up picking up the barn and putting it on a concrete pad or restoring a wood floor. But, and, and we'll show the pictures of that in a minute, but here's a, looking at the outside and the side way of that doorway, you can see where the floor, floor is on the left in the doorway. And you can see the ground up high where the joint, where the, where the sill is. So, you know, that sill is basically rotting away because it's in direct contact with the soil um, going across that gable end of the barn. And you can see the rod at the bottom of the board. So you really want to grade around your barns correctly. And this is something you can do right off the bat, you know, that, that, will, that will help you with problems down the road is make sure that the uh, grade isn't up high to the wood sills, you know, so that the moisture is staying there and rotting them away. And when you drop it down, you want to make sure that the splash isn't going up on your sideboards and, and getting in there and rotting them. So dropping the grade here would help considerably. Once again, that's another picture of that rot. You can see it in, in the sideboards. And, and those are nice old sideboards. You can see they're really, those are probably the existing, the original sideboards of that barn, you know, um, and they could last forever. You know, the, the sideboards, the problem really comes in their proximity to the ground and the ground around them. But if, if they're up high enough, those sideboards uh, without any siding on them will be fine for a long time. And there you can see that rot, at least the grade's a little lower in that picture, but you can see the sill rot um, um, there. Okay, so here we're in that entrance way again. And this is the solution that I like for all barns um, uh, where you're gonna have a wood floor is that I, I want that connection across the entrance way between the queen posts on either side of that entrance. Um, but I also don't want to re revisit replacing that sill, right? So, so what I do is I drop back the main timber, the sill that connects across that 
entranceway. And that's what the big timber is you see there. Um, and in this case, that's a, that's a rot resistant uh, uh, wood. That's, that's uh, uh, tamarack, I believe. So if you're gonna use a natural wood, you wanna use a rot resistant wood for that timber because it's still gonna get some moisture on it, which would be tamarack, white oak, and, uh, or, or something that's rot resistant, um, uh, which is a treated hemlock timber. Um, or you can just, you can put something on the front of that timber that is gonna get, act as a moisture barrier. And that could be a, a pressure treated board or a piece of uh, a plastic trim. Um, but anyway, so I've dropped that back and then I'm gonna, then where the door comes over, I'm gonna replace that um, with a stone sill, you know, and, and that makes us not have that problem again, going down the road. So that solves that. So we're never gonna revisit that problem. We talk about, you know, rest restoring a barn. We wanna restore it in such a way where the maintenance down the road isn't a revisited problem and also reduce the costs down the road so that future generations don't have to um, uh, have the same kind of expense um, in the restoration. And, and one of the reasons also with this, so most bar whenever a barn has an interior sliding door across the main entranceway, that, that's gonna rot away that, that, that timber at the entranceway, the sill much faster because it's always exposed whether the door is open or closed to rot. So you can see that now we've got a ramp that comes up to the stone threshold and the wood is set back behind the door for protection when the door is closed. Now, usually when you get on either side of those entranceways, um, you're, you're gonna have some rot at the bottom of the queen posts on either side of the entranceway because one, the dirt's been high, the sill got rotted away and, and the bottom of the post will have rotted in, in that same exposure period of time. And, and usually you can do, a, if it's just slow down, you can do a, a small uh, a patch onto the post, but you don't want it to be like a straight lap. You want it to have some sort of angles on it so it locks it in there so that, the, uh, so that, the, so that it, it maintains the integrity of the strength of that post and that timber because that keeps it from moving. So you can see that, that angle cut at the very top of that patch and that keeps that from moving. Um, I also wouldn't hesitate with a small patch like that to add some kind of epoxy um, when I'm putting it in there, um, which will also help in the strength of that. So on the other side, you can see where with the rock extended higher up in that post, and that's basically uh, because the trim boards on the outside of that entranceway, and remembering it's an interior slider, um, had rotted away and the, the rot was able to get higher up on that post. So that's a taller uh, uh, patch, and that's a, that's a much more traditional lap on that one. And that one, you really don't have to epoxy. You can see the angled joints on the top and the bottom. Um, pegging that is fine and maintains the integrity of that post. So this was just a little diversion of a problem that in the entranceways of, of both bank and ground level barns. So now I'm gonna go back to just basically talking about bank barns and we'll go to the basement of that barn. And, and once again, you'll notice one, you can almost see where water has run across the basement of that barn. You can see it's really mucky and you can see the, the amount of timbers uh, posts that are in supporting that floor up above. You know, so, so you know you have some, some pretty good floor problems up above and, and, um, and those posts are all in bad condition. So this is a barn where you're gonna, you're gonna make a decision uh, to basically do some support there and excavate all the organic matter out and redo all the posting. And there's a couple of ways you can go about redoing the posting and that depends on the seriousness, seriousness of the rot of that first floor. Okay, which is going to which is going to inform you on on which decision to go to whether to take out that first floor framing, and and repair it all the way up, or or to just add 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 more timbering underneath it, being posts, new posts and timbers, horizontal timbers. So this this is the uh, the uphill side of the barn, the bank side, um, and usually this is where the foundation is having a problems, you know, and you can see mortar on the inside of that foundation, which usually I don't like to see because basically it's just the inside of that foundation that's mortared. And so the outside where the moisture is moving that barn uh, comes down off the roof. And, and even if it's not on a slope, there's a lot of moisture that comes off a roof um, and without any drainage on that side. And with the, with, the, with the stones, the dry laid foundation now mortared, the moisture can't get through that foundation fast. So it will pool back there and freeze and cause even more force in the freeze thaw cycle against that foundation. So I really don't like to see mortar as a solution um, in those situations. But you can see also in this picture, an extra added posting and an extra timber right close to the, uh, the foundation wall of, of, of this barn. And that indicates a problem up above in the barn and with the floor system itself 
And that problem up above is that's where the cows were. Okay, and so cows produce a lot of moisture, right? And so, and especially in the wintertime when they're inside all the time, the floor system uh, gets rotten and rots underneath. And so that extra posting and that extra timber in, in the underside was that that floor system was, was having problems. And the farmer noticed it and put that extra thing down there before he lost a cow down into the basement, you know? So, so and, and, and what informs you, if you don't have stanchions, what informs you of what was in the upper floors of the barn is where the whitewash is. So this, you can, we have the stanchions and we can see the gutter there. So we know that there were cows there, but they're all whitewash. If, if those have all been removed and the floor looks just flat, then there's gonna be the whitewashes that's gonna give you that indication. Now in a lot of barns, that where they must might have milked into the 1960s or something, um, you want to see a wood floor. So this 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 barn hasn't been milked in uh, for a long time. But if you if you have if you have a barn where you've had skim coated concrete over that wood floor, then you'll know that they milked after after the you know late 50s and into the 60s because then you couldn't milk on a wood floor anymore. Um, and and that skim coating of concrete. Uh, exacerbates this problem because usually it doesn't withstand the force of, you know, a, a, a thousand, you know, heavy animal like a cow walking back and forth on it, it cracks. And then the moisture really gets locked underneath there and it rots that floor out a lot faster. So you saw us looking at the doorway at the back of the, that barn, the back end of the, of the, of the cow shed. And, um, and there was a door back there. And what that door was, was where the cows, there used to be a ramp down to the basement and that's where the cows went down to the basement of the barn. Um, and that's what that stone in the basement is an indicator of is the old stone ramp that went up. And those are some kind of the fun things that you just notice when you're looking at a barn and you, and you want to document. You might change them, but it's nice to document and have those pictures of, of what was going on in, that, in, in the barn at that in different periods of time. Okay, I'm looking up at the added timber on, on this barn underneath the, the regular flooring system. And so the, this barn up above is uh, probably 18, you know, 60s, uh, I would say. But when you look at the flooring system, you've got some round half logs and stuff like that. And a lot of times in barns, the first floor system was uh, pieces of an older barn that had been on site before. And so you'll see half logs and some hewn timbers and stuff like that. And then the new barn was, you know, built on top of that. But so when you're looking at a barn, so this is part of that decision-making process. And we're in the basement and we're saying, well, what are we gonna do about the floor system? It's got some rot. We, we really wanna have uh, change the timbering under there or change the floor system. Uh, we, need, we need, know we need to change the posts, right? So even if we're just changing the posts, we have to support the floor while we change the posts. And when you're doing that, you have to look above you and say, okay, well, what's the condition of the floor, especially when you see added timbers and, and where, so in, in relation to how I'm going to support it in order to do that, you know, and if the joinery and the floor is rotten up above, then that makes it more complicated in how you're going to support where the load bearing post is coming down the floor system so that you can do the repairs underneath. And you can see where I'm, my finger is pointing there, that there's, uh, that there's pretty, fairly significant rot. Um, where the different timbers would have been joined into each other. So I can't pick this barn up. I can't support it um, by just one timber on the side if I had good tenons going through there. Um, I have to support that more all the way around to replace the posting and then put you know, new timbers underneath down to stuff, you know, down to the floor, uh, ground level. But that doesn't, uh, this doesn't necessarily mean I'm gonna make a decision to redo this whole floor. Um, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But if you are gonna redo the whole floor, which is what this is an example of, uh, this is not that particular barn, this is a different barn, but this is also a barn where the floor system was really rotten. It's a bank barn once again, uh, it had a lot of organic matter in the basement. The floor system was bad enough that it really needed to be taken out and replaced. And in order to do that, and then, you know, if I'm gonna fix foundations on the side or replace sills, I'm gonna pick the barn up on the queen posts, the posting above that first floor system. So I'm gonna take out that first floor and then I'm gonna uh, excavate the organic material and, and build cribbing and, and, and fasten my the steel or whatever I'm gonna to use to pick up that building up on those posts up above the first floor so I can affect all the repairs in one pick. And there's a situation where you're looking at budget and you say, well, can I phase this repair and there's a situation where you can't phase the repair. You have to kind of jump in and do it all in one shot because the floor system's gone. 
uh, the posting is gone in the basement and you have some foundation issues. So that's a big, that's a, that's a big, you know, uh, part of a pro the project right from the bat. So that you're, you're going to jump into that major repair right off. Um, so we've, we've taken out the first floor. You can see once again, the example of the posting being really bad in that basement, you know, really not very good footing. You can see crushed cinder blocks underneath the posting and you can see the moisture um, in that ground underneath. And this is an example of how that repair looks further down the road. And so you can see the example of, of uh, picking the barn up high on the posts. You can see the steel sticking beyond and the bracket I used to fasten the steel onto the posts. Um, and then the, on the, the massive, the timbering down below is the cribbing towers that we use to, to get up to that steel where the jacks are to support the barn. And what that allows us to do is do all the repairs in one shot. And so that's a new floor system coming across. Um, that's a different type of lat joint. That's a lat joint I like to use in horizontal timbers. Um, and, and it's not underneath the post, which you'll notice. And the reason it's not underneath the post is because I want to get that posting back in there as soon as possible. And so the lat joint can be underneath where the knee brace then transfers that, that uh, the, uh, the uh, strength of that lat joint down to the post and transfers the load down to the post of the floor system. So you, you, if you're gonna do a lap joint, it has to be on a post or it has to be on a knee brace to, to do this, to support the barn correctly. So this is a, floor, this is a barn, bank barn where that floor system has been replaced, okay? And, and you can see uh, some lap joints where some timber repair happened. And you can see the posting in the basement. And, and the reason this picture is in here is because I wanted to show you what the posting should look like in the basement when the repair is done. So you, you can see that the organic matter is gone. There's nice uh, uh, gravel, or it could be crushed bank run or whatever in the basement of that barn to get rid of, it's gotten rid of the organic matter. In this case, we put drainage in that basement of the barn, um, but you can see the post coming down onto some nice stones that are set on a, a good uh, a hole of crushed stone. And I like crushed stone because it's got high compaction, 90% compaction just going in the hole. But you can see on the bottom of those posts, you can see that little white, and that's a piece of uh, plastic trim. And I put that on the bottom of the post when I install it so that the end grain on the bottom of that new post can't wick up moisture where it's in connection with the stone underneath. Um, and, and that's an important thing to do because that's once another, that's a detail that means that keeps maintenance uh, minimal going down into the future going into the future. Now, the other thing that I like is also if I'm on a bank barn, or barn I like to put some knee bracing in there um, to sort of resist movement if there is any kind of movement in the foundation going, going down the road. Um, and hopefully there won't be if the repair is done correctly, but that's just another piece of insurance. And you can see that knee bracing coming off, the, off to the main timbers of the uh, floor system off those posts. Okay, here's a situation where we kind of make a budget decision. Now, this is a bank barn and it's a big bank barn. Uh, this barn um, is in Nottingham, and, and this barn was uh, over 100 feet. And, and so this barn had some floor system issues in rot in the floor system. And it, it didn't have a lot of movement downslope, but it had some. Um, and, and, uh, it, and so what happens when you got, uh, and it's posting in the basement was in bad shape. Um, and so you have to make a decision because it's a big barn. And, and you don't want to lose this barn because once again, your decision process is involved in what happens if I lose this barn? This is, this is a connected barn, it's a huge barn, right? And to, if you don't do anything to this barn and it continues to go into disrepair, the cost of taking down this barn, a barn this size would be $30,000, $40,000, right? And it could even, it would probably even been more than that given the dumpsters, you can't burn them obviously. And this one's attached to the house and, and, and dumpsters are, you know, large dumpsters, 700, $800 a can. And there's a lot of cans in this. So, so you have to look and say, well, okay, I wanna maintain this barn. How am I gonna fix it? You know, and one, I like the barn anyways, cause if without this barn, it's just a house standing there. Okay. Um, and, and, and also you look at this barn and by the way, you can see that it was con uh, converted to a chicken barn by the amount of windows that got added into that barn. So this was a big barn that got converted to ch for uh, chickens. So this is the basement of that barn. Now, this is, this is after the work is done, but the, 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 uh, the posting, and there's a lot of organic matter, the posting was all gone in this barn, but the floor system, the main timbers of the floor system all had significant rot where the posting was. 
Now, in order to uh, support this barn, like let's say let's say we were going to do what you saw in the previous pictures, and we're going to take out that first floor and we're going to support it up higher and put a whole new first floor system in this barn. Given the size of this barn, you know, fifty by hundred, you you'd get up in, with with everything. You'd get up to one hundred fifty two hundred thousand dollars to do this repair, and and that's a lot lot to chew on. So so how do we do this where we can ensure the strength of the barn that the barn's going to stay standing? Um, and make sure and, and solve the problems of the rot in those first floor timbers and the rot underneath. And, and basically, then you have to figure out how you're going to pick it up underneath. And you're going to get your steel in there to support it in such a way that you can then add these new timbers underneath the main timbers and add new posts underneath. Um, and, and that's hard to do. Um, and it really needs uh, uh, an expert to do it. But I wanted to show this as an option because you know you can't always afford the budget of, of fit, doing a whole new first floor, and this will solve that problem. Um, and and but it it won't have that big ticket price. I mean, there's still a significant ticket price in this kind of barn, but it, but it doesn't get you to that huge repair, you know. Um, and and so you know I, that that's one way to go. Um, but let's say this was this place. This, let's say. This was the barn we were just looking at. This is a different barn, but let's say we, this was the barn and the uphill foundation had that kind of problem, this kind of problem in it. And you can see this barn, this foundation has already been partly rebuilt um, where you can see the screw jacks on top of the new foundation going up. But if you look down to where the old foundation hasn't been removed, you can see the, where the stones have really pushed away and pushed into the foundation of that barn. So this informs the decision that, okay, there's a barn where I can't just replace I can't just add more posting, more timbers underneath that floor system. I've got to redo the foundation. And, and so that, that drives you into that next level of repair because you're going to pick up the barn where you can do that. And usually it's going to be higher up, especially if it has rotten sills. And, and so you're going to take out that floor system and you're going to replace it. So if that's the case, then the decision becomes, am I going to do that in stone or am I going to do that in concrete? Okay, and you can do it in concrete. There's no problem in doing it in concrete. But if you're gonna replace a barn foundation, especially down the length of the walls in concrete, you don't want an eight inch concrete wall. Um, you really want uh, something that's 12 inches. Um, the 12 inches also gives you an advantage up higher. If you really wanna look at granite up higher, you can add a shelf to the foundation where you can add granite on the higher spot. So that's what you see above grade. Um, uh, but you don't want to just have an eight inch wall and you still have to repair all the drainage at the same time. You still have to pick it up and support it in the same way. But rebuilding a stone foundation is, is labor intensive and it's not the choice that everybody's going to make. But this is the beginning of a rebuild of a stone foundation. You can see the base stones uh, going in and you can see the support underneath the barn. But this is how a stone foundation, a new stone foundation looks. I mean, the other problem of a lot of bank barns and the reason they have that problem is that the moisture can take advantage of the fact that when they first built these foundations, they built them to get height faster because they're building them with oxen and A-frames to get those stones in place. And they went for height. So they didn't build the foundations monolithically into the bank, right, with tie stones and everything else and, and backer stones. So that when the freeze thaw cycle did happen, it could really push that, those, well, those foundations that were just going for vertical height much quicker than a can of foundation that's built like this. This foundation is never going to move due to frost because of the backer stones, tie stones that are connecting back there. It's got drainage at the bottom. You see landscape cloth on the left hand side of the picture. You know, that's to keep dirt from going down and, 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 and clogging the drainage that's way at the bottom of that foundation. And that's what a stone foundation looks like when it's been replaced. And in that picture, we're looking at the end of the end of the barn, looking in the other direction from where we saw that big curve out at the bottom. Um, but this is this is also a situation where the material is nice, and that also informs the decision. You know, you have really nice split granite in this foundation. We can we can build quickly. Um, we got nice sill stones for the top, um, and so we can we can really do a nice job. Where you have a lot of round field stone. Um, that might inform the decision differently where you might say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna go with concrete because I don't have good stone. I'm gonna have to get a lot of new stone to rebuild this foundation. Ian, I just wanted to give you a 10 minute warning. Oh boy, I'm moving then. Okay, basement of a barn. Uh, what informs that decision also is, is how bad the movement in the barn is. And you can see in the basement of the barn, we can see that flex down in the floor system here. 
you can see cinder blocks piled. I mean, that's gonna inform you that this floor system is gonna go. And, and that also informs you, because there you see a queen post coming up to the hayloft area. You can see the tear out in the tenon there. And, and, and that says, okay, I gotta pick up this barn to do this repair. In, in a repair like this, it's not that you have to replace that, that, that beam that's got the tear out. You can put a Dutchman in there and glue it in there and get the strength back in there, but you're gonna pick up that barn. Bank barns, okay, I'm gonna fly through this one, but bank barns, it's gonna be the floor system, the first floor system that's really gonna inform the decision. And this barn, you can see, uh, this is in Moulton, uh, Moulton Borough, and you can see the sag in the barn. You can see that there's problems in that first floor system. And there you go, the fourth floor is even gone in this barn and the posts are rotting into the ground. And that informs that you're gonna, what you're gonna do with this barn. And there's a queen post in the center aisle and that's the ground right underneath that, that queen post in the center aisle. There's a different barn, uh, but this barn you can see underneath the floor system where the stones have, are moving away. And so, you, you know, you're gonna, usually you're gonna replace the first floor and you're gonna put new, footing, new stones underneath a, a ground level barn, or you're gonna dismantle it and you're going to uh, put it on a concrete pad. There's a, this is a ground level barn in New Hampton, beautifully hewn barn. The first floor system was gone. We've picked it up. You can see the tenons on the bottom. And you can see in this case, we put a whole new frost wall stone foundation. And you can see that's ready for the new floor system to go in. You don't have to do a frost wall all the way around the stone. It can be just under the load bearing points stone. And, and that's where the posts are. It doesn't have to be stone connected all the way across. But there you can see the stone connected all the way across and the new floor system in and the barn sitting down on it. This is a barn that's worth any money to restore it in my book because this was a beautiful barn. Um, so we're getting up, upstairs above that ground system of the barn. And that's when you start looking at the frame and what needs to be done to the frame. And a lot of times in the frame, the farmers have made adjustments to the frame that have caused problems that have weakened that frame. This is that same barn and it had king posts in it and the king posts all got taken out. It was a center aisle barn with queen posts and the king posts were going off the top of the connecting timber across the center aisle at the top. They took them out to make room for a hay fort, but that strongly weakened that, that, that the roof system of that barn. So this is the king posts replaced in that barn after the hay, traveling hay fork was removed. This is the bank barn that we started with. And once again, they cut out top timbers to make room for a traveling hay fork. And that was very common. And you can see the tenon that connected across that added more strength across the top of the, the connecting across the gable of the barn. They cut, off, across the, cut out the tenon so that, and they moved it down and that's it further down. And you can see a steel dog in there and you can see a little piece of wood underneath it supporting it. And usually they had pound in some big, you know, big, big nails to hold that in there. It doesn't make the same connection across the, uh, the gable of the barn, across the width of the barn. You really want that tenon and the peg. So you really want to redo that timber back where it was with a tenon and a peg. And it's either done by putting a tenon in there um, and then cutting this, a slot for the tenon in the timber and moving it up and pegging it or cutting an elongated mortise so you can drop this timber back in where it used to go. Rotten timbers, okay, upper system, upper level rotten timbers. That's what that repair looks like after you've done that um, with a nice locking lap joint in new sills. Okay, now I'm gonna go back to this picture of the barn in Moultonboro and how you make decisions. This barn, the first floor system was gone. And when you look up at the roof of this, this, this barn, you could see indications of rot where the roof had failed and, and, and rot in main timbers, right? Right there, you've got a, a top plate timber and you can see the, the, the uh, rot and the white, in looking at that white and the, and the uh, moisture um, staining, that that timber's got some serious problems. The posting at the bottom all needs patches on it. So that, that informs you that this barn has, you know, you're gonna repair main timbers in the barn. The first floor system is gone. That says, well, okay, the best thing to do with this barn is to take it down, do the repairs and put it back up again. And you can put it back up on a wood floor, you know, with, with the load point supported under by stone or a whole new floor system and a frost wall stone, or you can put it up on a concrete pad. And if you're going to put it up on a concrete pad, then you, then you, you put a, uh, a, um, uh, you know, a nice base to the interior posts where they're going to get fastened onto that concrete pad. And on the outside, fasten a pressure treated or a moisture-resistant timber with a moisture barrier underneath it where the, the tenons can come down into. 
And, and that decision gets made by what you're going to use the barn for. If you're going to use it for farm equipment and repairs and stuff like that, then I would advise the concrete floor. If you're going to use it for horses, I would, I would advise the concrete floor and then, then put stall mats on it, you know, um, uh, or, you know, something different. Okay, so you don't always get clear indications of what's going on also. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, this, this whiteness that you see in here is either due to failure of the roof system and moisture running down or it's due to animal nesting, okay? But what's, what, what, that will cause rot as well. So it, that, that says you have to really look closer, much more closer at these things and get up there and have a look. Um, but you can also look at a barn where you look underneath the, the, uh, the roof system and you won't see, it'll look fine. And this is the barn, this is the Goss barn in Rye. The roof system looked fine underneath it. But when the barn, when a barn has a roof that's gotten leaky and it's not indicated in the boards around the main timbers, sometimes the, the moisture will hit those main timbers and just follow down the main timbers and go into where you see joinery, like those drop-in purlins in those main rafters. And it'll rot the timber from above and you can't necessarily always see it from underneath. So you always have to be prepared for the for for surprises in these situations. And in this situation, we had to replace the main rafters, uh, a couple of the main rafters, and all the purlins going down this barn. Where underneath the barn, you had no indication of that until you stripped out the roof from up above. Okay, how bad does a barn get, and how do you make the decision when the barn's bad? Okay, this barn looks bad, you know, um, and obviously it's always budgetary considerations. But this was that barn. This is that barn where I showed you the new floor system, and the new frost wall going around it. And this was a beautiful early 1870 frame, heavily timbered, nicely hewn, and well worth saving. And it survived the movement. And this is significant movement, even without main structural failure in the joinery up above. So it was well worth doing. This is that barn today um, under the new, uh, on its new foundation. And it, you know, it's gonna be a joy for generations to come. Um, I mean, the, the timbers that were in that barn were probably saplings in the 1500s and you just, you know, it, it, well worth it. Um, the landscape without this barn would have, been, would have been really a sad thing to see it go. It looked awful, but you know, well worth it. And that's it, Beverly, how am I doing? <laughs> I can't hear you, Bev. Thank you so much, Ian. That was great. And you're right on time. You're actually a minute oh, early. Do you want I to talk? Burned, I burned the last slides. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, once again, I'll just say to people, your, your decisions are based, are driven by the condition of the barn, but also by budget. And, and you don't give up, right? You get as many opinions as you can and make your, dis and, 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 and whether you can phase it or not is driven by the condition of the barn. But you know, um, there are things you can do that can then, you know, at least pass it on to a future generation to even do the full repair. But there's costs to doing nothing. That's what everybody has to remember. Mm -hmm. There's costs to doing nothing. You know, whether it be your insurance company saying, hey, we're not going to cover this anymore. You have to take the barn down or, you know, or just having it as an eyesore. Or, but there's costs to doing nothing. <laughs> Great. Ian, there was one question relating to this barn asking what part of this barn was saved. And I do you have any, you didn't put any interior photos of this one. Well, the, 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 the photos of the restored king posts was the interior okay. of this barn. Um, and, and, and other than that, uh, there was a few other replacements in this barn and some bottoms of posts where they had cut them out to make room for a, a, a manure spreader to get underneath the downhill side of this barn. But almost 100. I mean, I would say probably 80 percent of this barn, or more than that, is is the original barn. Yeah, I think you misspoke. I think you said 1870 frame, but oh, that's 1780. Really... I'm sorry. So switch that around. 1780 frame. Yeah. So yes. this was an amazing frame. Right. So so that's the other decision making process is what you want your barn to look like at the end. Also, like I mean, this barn is a beautiful stone foundation. You look at the outside. Nobody's going to say, well, there's a 1780 barn inside there, right? But you know, it, it, the, the, the barn boards will, will weather a nice brown and it'll look fine in, eventually. I mean, one of the things that drives also the decision-making making process in a barn is, are you gonna pick it up to level and true or are you gonna, you're gonna support it in the condition it's in? You know, where it's moved to. And that decision gets informed by the failure of the joinery up above, okay? If the joinery is really failed up above, then you're gonna pick it up. 
and, and, and fix that, that, that failed joinery. And it's also a decision is made by what's been done to the roof up above. If somebody's re-roofed it and they put plywood down, then that was gonna inform that decision as well because the plywood's gonna lock it in the position that it was in when it, the plywood was put on. So that would have to be removed. Okay, we had another question on wood types. I know you touched on some rot resistant. Yep. Someone had asked a question about the very first barn, the new Boston barn. Uh, what type of wood was it even higher up in the frame? Uh, the new Boston barn. That was uh, uh, mostly pine and hard pine in that upper frame. There wasn't a lot of hemlock in that frame. Uh, in the old frame, you can, you can tell hemlock, you know, usually, well, not just by the grain, but by the, the checks in it. Hemlock tends to check a lot more when it when it dries than 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 uh, pine white pine does. Um, uh, you know, I, I rarely run into um, I, I'll run into some chestnut every once in a while, but it, mostly your upper frames are going to be pine. In your in your really in your old barns, your 1700 barns and your early 1800 barns, you know your knee braces and and that's true of most barns. Your knee braces are going to be oak. You know, they're going to be red or white oak or something like that. The smaller the timber, uh, the the uh, the stronger the wood it's going to be. Okay. Um, another question about the organic material in the basement. Yeah. How you get that out and what you replace it with. When okay. You're so, out. so if if <laughs> it depends on how how big the basement is. So usually I I use a a um, a, a T one ninety that's a, a skid steer with a short height on it. You know, to the top, so I can drive under there and I'll I'll use a tooth bucket and I'll dig it all out. Um, you can rent those. You can rent um, uh, even manually walk behind uh, buckets where you can get under there, which if you don't have the height you need. Um, uh, and there's nothing wrong as long as you watch your post supports, you're not undermining your post supports of digging down fairly deep around those, you know, to get that organic matter. So sometimes I'll make room for my bobcat by start starting on the outside and, and, and digging in, you know, and what do I replace that with? Is if it's if it's got significant moisture problems or ground moisture problems, then I'm going to put some piping in there to take the water outside to daylight or to a to a dry well. Um, but I'm going to replace that with um, uh, crushed stone uh, um, uh, uh, because of the compaction on it. If depending on what I want to go under there, so if I'm going to drive under there, I might put crushed stone to begin with, and then put um, a landscape cloth over it, and then I might put uh, hard pack you know, farmer's mix or something on that because it's easier for driving equipment on that without it squishing around through the gravel, and what have you. If you use inch and a half, that's less of a problem, inch and a half crushed stone. But, th but that's what I would use. Okay, and then there was a question about solar panels. Yeah. And I think solar panels are great. Um, if I'm going to put them on a barn roof, uh, I'm going to put a metal roof on that barn. Um, uh, and that can be, that can be uh, your old uh, type screw on metal roof or it can be standing seam. Standing seam is nice because they just fasten it to the to the uh, to the clips you know, with clips to the uh, to the ridge you know where they join this, the different pans together. Um, but I'm going to do a metal roof because I'm not going to have to replace you know take that solar system off to replace that roof. I really don't like to see solar panels on an asphalt roof because most of the time in that installation they're making that water tight with lots of silicone and that's not gonna that's not long term. You know, so I really like to, if I'm going to put any panels on a roof, I like to see a roof system that's not going to wear out every 25 years or so. Okay, and program note, we are having a talk on April 15th about putting solar on historic structures, including barns. Yeah, I mean, but barn roofs offer great expanses for, for good solar arrays. Okay. Um, powder post beetles yep. and, and other wood boring pests. Okay. Uh, powder post beetles, um, and, well, the first thing is to remove the organic matter and get rid of the moisture issues, you know. Um, so those basements that have a lot of organic matter, they, they, they tend to hold moisture down there, and which is what, what is, it gives you the good habitat for the powder post beetle. Um, also, don't have a lot of wood hanging around in your barn, in the basement or upstairs in the barn. You know, if you've got stacks of wood that have been sitting in there for a long time, a, a long time, take them out use them for kindling or something. But those are those also uh, are habitat for the beetle. Um, I like to use a powder post beetle. I like to use a, a product called boric hair, but any boric acid product will do. Um, and it's it's uh, pretty um, safe to use as far as pets and all that are concerned. Um, and it, it, it'll take care of the powder post beetle. Um, you can also get uh, uh, little um, round 
uh, dowel-like boric hair things which you can drill and insert into the timbers, but I prefer just to stir the, uh, spray the timbers at least once a year, you know? So when you're doing like a ground floor system like this barn here, you want to have an access door because you're still going to want to spray it. Even though we, all the organic matter was gone underneath this barn, you still want to spray it every once in a while, you know? So um, you want to have access, you want to have enough room to get under there and do it. But, uh, you know, once a year, spray it with, with uh, boric hair. Uh, carpenter ants, that doesn't work. I tend to go with real nasty chemicals for carpenter ants. You know, carpenter ants take it, uh, uh, are taking advantage of wood that's already wet, you know? So also I want to get rid of that moisture problem. I want, don't want to have dirt pile up against the side of the sills or what have you, because um, that's, that's where the carpenter can, ants are going to get in there. If there's carpenter ants in the roof system, it's because the roof's been leaking, you know? Uh, but I, I usually use pretty good chemicals for, for, for carpenter ants. Okay. Um, here's another question. Assuming budget allows for jacking and floor removal, but does not allow for further work budget-wise for another year, what do you say? What are your recommendations? Well, I mean, if the floor system is such that it needs floor removal, then, then I would go ahead and do it and, and, and get that new floor system in and get the footing underneath it done at the same time and the posting. So that's all correct. Um, uh, you can always, uh, after that point, uh, go back and take care of upper problems, except for repairs of bottoms of posts. I would do the repair of the bottoms of posts at that same time. Um, uh, but then you can go and take care of roof system if you want, you know, later on. Okay. And then another question relating to wood bores. Um, they have wood bores and some of their beams, do they always need to be replaced? Uh, no, it depends on to the extent that the wood wood bore has caused damage. Yeah, you know, I mean, if it's if it's only minimal damage or or just in the center, um, uh, you can put a Dutchman in there. You can you want to make sure it's not leaking or the moisture is getting there anymore. But you can also if it's if it's there's no structural damage, you can just take the material out the the wood that they've infected out of there, and then uh, pour you know take epoxy and you mix it with a filling compound and you can put epoxy in there. Okay. And I think we've covered, oh, what do you use for carpenter ants? Uh, um, I actually just go to the grain store and get uh, whatever they have uh, uh, there. I can't remember the actual names um, of the chemicals that are in those sprays, um, but, you know, and, and to be honest, if you, if, uh, um, you, you also can also go online. I mean, I tend to use a lot of products from a company called Do-It-Yourself Pest Control. Mm -hmm. um, and you can go online to them and they, and they are very good educational. They'll, they'll tell you what you need to get and what you need to use. Um, they have some nice injectable uh, gels that you can squeeze into a, a mortise area around the tenon. And, those, and so they, those act as baits, which the carpenter ants then take back to their nests. And those really, really work well. So if, you can't, if you're seeing ants and you can't find where they are, like you can't find the damage, then you, you get those injectable syringes and you, you know, if you've seen them concentrated around a certain area, but you can't get to where they've been, where their actual home is, you know, you inject around the, the more, you know, the way the mortise and tendons are where you see them and, and, and they'll take that back to the nest and, it, and you, they will be gone after that. And mention um, the presence of frass. Frass? You know, that, that looks like, um... Sawdust, if you see that, some people don't realize that that's an indication of. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so if, if you got little holes with fine dust, that's powder post beetle. If you have anything larger than fine dust, that's going to be going to be carpenter ants or it could be termites, you know, because we do have termites too. But, but uh, you know, carpenter ants, also you find carpenter ants also by, if you're looking around, you know, and, uh, you'll find dead carpenter ants. They tend to dump the dead out of the out of, the, out of their nests, you know, and you'll find dead ones. Um, that's an indicator of where they're going in and out of the building. You know, our, our carpenter ants tend to be more nocturnal to a certain extent, you know. So if you go around your building with a flashlight in the evening, you can find where their runs are, you know, and you can, you can inject those, those bait compounds in where, in where those spots are, and that'll get, might get rid of them higher up in a roof system or what have you, because you can't always go up there and find exactly where they are, you know. But if you watch around the building, you'll, you'll find where their trails are. And you can actually hear them oh, sure. munching away. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. I've been told I'm crazy because I hear them, but I nope. absolutely do hear them. No, nope. yeah, no, you definitely can. I, I mean, yeah. if for new house, if you have a house with stress skin panels, you can hear them munching on those stress skin panels, but you know, you'll hear them, you know. Okay, here's a question about bat smell. 
in the barn? How do you get rid of a bat smell? Or <laughs> let's just broaden it. How do we yeah. get rid of bats? Or do well, we? Bats are pretty hard to get rid of, you know. Um, and to be honest, I, I mean, I like bats. I mean, you know, they they reduce the bad bug population. You can build bat houses to try and convince them to not be in your barn, you know. Um, uh, but other than that, you know, you just you have to just remove the the guano and and use a little bleach to get rid of the smell. Um, but you also want to protect your respiratory system if you're going to do that. You know, you want to wear a good respirator. And that's true of any kind of, you know, if it's raccoons, specifically raccoons, because they're the worst, but porcupines, there's a lot of critters that make homes and barns. And you always want to be protected when you're removing any of their, their leavings. Fine. And porcupines can do a lot of damage to barns as well. Okay. And one final question. Actually, there's two here that relate to the same thing. Just in general, how does one get a barn assessment done? And I'm going to put the sponsor page up. How's that? <laughs> okay, you do um, that. How do you get a barn assessment done? Well, um, uh, I uh, you can talk, contact Beverly through the uh, Preservation Alliance, and she'll she'll hit she'll hit you up with uh, I mean uh, with a lot of barn specialists that they have on their books and she'll hit you up and, and get an evaluation done. If, if you if you don't want to go through, go through that route, then you that's can a grant through. assessment grant that's program. Grant that assessment program. You can go through a directory and just call one of the barn uh, professionals um, uh, that are connected with the Preservation Alliance. Um, uh, if, if, if people want to give a, a good donation to the Preservation Alliance, I'm interested in coming out and seeing the barn. But uh, usually I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw this out there, Jennifer, uh, but I usually charge half a day of consulting. And that ends up being around $350, $400, depending on where you are. And if people wanna donate that to the Preservation Alliance, I'll come out and see your barn. Okay, thank you. So at this time, I think I'm gonna do my wrap up comments. And then for those folks who want to stay on, Ian has agreed for another to do another 15 minutes or so of Q&A. So we'll do that after. But I just wanted to thank Ian again for this practical, informative talk based on decades of experience working with historic barns. We hope you've learned some best practice tips and now have a better understanding of some common barn problems and how to possibly phase their repair um, and to make the project more economically feasible. We love getting barn owners and enthusiasts together to share practical information, make connections and offer a dose of energy and inspiration too. Thoughtful and experienced presenters like Ian and your great questions and involvement make a huge impact on advancing barn preservation interest and efforts across New Hampshire. We want you to know that the Alliance is here to help and encourage you to check out our website at NH Preservation or send us an email to bt at nhpreservation.org at any time along the way while you're doing a project. We'd love to see photos of barn projects or if you have a question, feel free to send images and I'd be happy to try to get back to you. Um, if you've not already done so, please check out our website for the schedule of Expo on the Road programs. Our April lineup includes Stonewall History and Preservation, and as I mentioned, solar installations on historic buildings, including barns, energy efficiency in older homes, and porch history and preservation. We're excited about the lineup and hope you are too. Visit our website to learn more and to register for these great programs. We hope today's program has inspired you to move forward with your barn projects. As I said, feel free to send questions relating to them. We look forward to seeing you at future programs and encourage you to share our Expo website link with other old house and barn enthusiasts. And to be sure to check out our Expo guide of 50 products and service providers on the Expo page of the website. And for those of you who have been to our in-person Expo in the past, you know how we love to give away door prizes at our event as a token of our appreciation of your participation. So I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Jennifer Goodman, to announce the lucky winner of the barn evaluation with Ian. So Jennifer. Right, what a great donation, Ian, and a great talk. And the, um, we randomly select a number and participant Joan Skews, I hope I'm saying her name right, from Kensington is the winner. Joan will be in touch with Joan about um, arranging a time with Ian. And Joan, if you can stay on for our extra time with Ian, we'd love to meet you and have a quick chat about your barn. Um, okay, thank you, Jennifer. Um, so please watch for a follow-up email from the Alliance with links to other barn resources and expo events. 
information on the very important barn tax incentive program, which the deadline is April 15th, um, and an evaluation that will help us plan for future programs. And please, please keep the Preservation Alliance vibrant by making a donation or considering a gift membership. Thanks again to Ian for his inspiring presentation, to our Old House and Barn sponsors on the screen, and to all of you for joining today. We wish you well with your work and most of all, wish you and your family good health. Be well, and for those who would like to stay on, please do so. For those who need to leave now, thank you so much for joining. Okay. Well, I'm gonna stop share, right? You can stop share, yes. There you go. All right. So let's introduce our winner. Is our winner here? She might have had to drop off, actually. Oh, that's too bad. Um, but this is John, her husband, the other skews. Oh, good. <laughs> Congratulations, John. Do you want to tell us about your barn? Uh, yeah, I've got my video on. Can you see our barn behind? Yeah, I can see it. Yes. Yeah, that, that's our barn. It's kind of big, and, um, and it needs some work. Uh, and uh, Lynn Monroe and her... Uh, cadre of barn people were out the other day and it is an old English barn and then it has that massive uh, loose hay storage and then the attached uh, sections um, you know the the attached sections uh, back to the house yep. so but but uh, there is you know obvious uh, rot problems and um, when they put that uh, loose hay barn in there they chopped out a lot of frame yeah and um because that roof line extends all the way to the to the south side so we're looking at the north side the roof line of the loose hay goes all the way to the south side of the english barn so they, they chopped away a lot of frame um but uh we would we're our, we have a finite budget, um, and um, and we want to get the barn stabilized. We have uh, an east end that needs a lot of work, and then you know, a lot of windows and some post rot and so forth and so on. And upper beams, you know, the usual, I think. Yeah. So, so how's the floor system in there? It's uh, there's uh, the floor section in the in the uh, kind of stanchion side is fine then it's really just a, a plank floor over the dirt or you know there's no basement yep um, ground level barn um, and there's one section that's kind of busted out but um, th the floor isn't really the problem the you know walls and and problematic roof angles and the resulting rot in the valleys. And even though we, so we've been there for about 35 years and our effort has really been to keep a roof on it. And, um, you know, while you're paying for all the other things and uh, expenses you incur in life. Um, but that's a great thing, John. Well, it's, my, it's my no, my, my, the principle I always went by is if you, if you if you don't have a roof, you don't have a barn. So, right. um, so that's where we've been at. And so, but yeah, our, so really, we're uh, and I do have a kind of a bullet list I sent to Lynn Monroe. But basically, it's structural elements, roofing and valley, siding, the east end, the west end, windows and doors, and then the main floor. And there are parts of it that I just like to have brought up to and basically to gravel um no need for concrete and just a level floor because in the loose hay area it's just this dugout section it's very strange i don't know why it is the way it is uh, it's very common in english barns actually to be dug out like that to yeah. yep. give you a few more feet <laughs> give you more feet of hay i mean they were basically for fodder storage i mean that was when the landscape was sheep you know it was mostly for sheep yeah back in those days and you know they would drive the sheep in in the wintertime sometimes and they would just you know eat their way 
yeah, that's what we did. Yeah. <laughs> until until the day when you said, did you feed the sheep today? No. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, there... John, keep us posted on on your barn prog progress. Uh, yes, and if uh, that'd be fun. And, well, uh, and as we said here, Joan uh, uh, won the evaluation, I guess. So I think. Uh, who do we want to contact about that? We'll, we'll contact you with details. Okay. <laughs> How right. to connect you with Ian. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm perfect. And then in the meantime, we've been, uh, we're emptying out the barn. So. Uh, Excellent. We didn't touch on that, but that's important. Sure. Not to fill the barns <laughs> too much. Yeah, no, enough. we're emptying it out. So anyways, I am going to sign off and get back to work. But I will look forward to talking to you guys. And thank okay. you so much. Thank you, John. Really appreciate it. And we do have a couple other questions um, folks have sent in. One is um, paint versus stain versus nothing, Ian, on the exterior of the, if you're putting up new boards. Yep. I have no problem with nothing. You know, it's less maintenance. Uh, it's long, you know, uh, pine let, will just weather a nice, nice uh, dark color. And uh, as, you know, as long as you're not getting that splash up at the bottom, you know, you'll get some, some black staining at the bottom, you know, faster than there other areas, but it'll last for a long time with nothing on it. You know, um, that barn in New Hampton, that early, that 18, that 1780 barn, you know, had the original sideboards on it and, and above the ground, they were all in fine shape, you know? Um, so, you know, they'd been on there for, you know, a long, long time and, and it was nothing on them. And that's, that's what I, I prefer if you want if you want paint, we, like a lot of times farmers uh, uh, put siding on their pine boards uh, and, and paint um, on the road sides, the show sides of the barn, you know. And uh, and I always say don't go to the paint, go to go to stain because uh, paint flakes and stain powders. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, or if you're going to use cedar sh shingles or something like that, just let those weather great. You know, um, but uh, you know, that, no siding is fine. I don't like board and batten uh, because uh, that makes it trickier as far as um, uh, above windows and above doorways uh, doing your uh, flashing details. So I prefer shiplap uh, to a board and batten. Um, and if you, in fact, if you look at uh, old board, boarding on most barns, um, you're gonna find that it's, it's a, some form of shiplap or tongue and groove, you know. Okay. And in relating to the grading around a barn yep. um, and the drip line and the stone you like to put on, can you explain that a little bit to folks to help reduce that splashback? Right. So I, I like, I, I want things to grade away from the barn, you know, um, and uh, so that you're not, the water's not pooling around the barn. Um, uh, and as far as splash up around the barn, um, I, you know, depending on the barn, I, mean, I do this on houses too. I'll put uh, you know, um, sort of uh, rough rounded stones or it can be gravel so that the drips don't come down and, and, and drip straight back on, on the building. Um, uh, because I like metal roofs, uh, gutters are problematic um, and gutters in New England, to me in New Hampshire are problematic anyways, but with a metal roof, the snow comes off in a hurry and you're gonna lose your gutters uh, quickly. And also a lot of people uh, don't downspout their gutter to a away from the barn to a drywall. It just dumps it right beside the barn, and that really sort of defeats the purpose. Um, regardless of whether the uh, whether the grading is away from the barn or not, I mean, I like to have some sort of uh, drainage in there, you know. And 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 it, you know, I didn't touch on this, but if you have a foundation that's starting to have problems, and you're not going to go to that expense of rebuilding the foundation, you know, you can uh, have somebody come in with a small excavator, and you can trench away from the barn, not directly beside the foundation, but away, you know, away and down. And then you can put a very heavy mill plastic right up tight to the barn and down into the bottom of that trench and put your drainage pipe back there so you're not impacting the stone foundation. And then that, take that away to daylight or a dry well. Um, but I mean, people don't, uh, you know, you have to do that because, you know, in a large barn, there's a lot of water that just even comes off the roof, you know. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we've covered most. Oh, Ian, footings in the basement. Yep. Um, are they required to go down? No, if you get, yeah, if you get rid of the organic matter, so that you got to get rid of the organic matter. 
So um, if you get rid of the organic matter and, and you get a nice hole to put crushed stone in, okay, with, with gravel, you know, clean gravel, not, not crushed gravel, because there's difference between crushed gravel and crushed stone. Crushed gravel has sand in it. So that's bank one gravel that's been crushed. Crushed stone is stone that's been crushed, okay? And has jagged edges on it, right? That stuff compacts really nicely. If you, you dig a hole and you put that in, it doesn't have to go down three feet. It could be just you know a foot or something like that, or coffee. And you and you put a nice big stone on top of that. That's a fine footing for any posting in the basement. It does not have to be concrete. The, the, what you know, it's the most important thing is to get rid of the moisture and get rid of the organic matter. And once again, you also when you put that new posting in, you don't want the end grain of the new post sitting right on the stone. That's really important to remember because that post will start start rotting. <laughs> So you put PVC? I put PVC or, or a plastic wood or something like that on the bottom of it. I mean, you could just paint it with epoxy, but that's not as good as doing that, you know? Uh, putting the PVC or the, or, or the, the, the uh, pressure treated on the bottom of that. E even if it's a moisture resistant wood, you wanna do something because end grain whips up moisture in a hurry. And it, you know, in, the, in the, this time of year when the stone is cold and you get a warm day, you know, the moisture condenses on that stone and it gets wicked up. Okay, and then one last question here. We had to replace siding on one side of our old barn and the fellow put up board and batten when the rest of the original siding was shiplap. Yeah. Did we just ruin our barn? No, you didn't ruin your barn. I just don't like board and batten because it makes it more complicated when you're doing flashing above windows and doors. And I, I don't like looking at board and batten, to be honest, I like a smooth, a smooth side. You didn't ruin your barn, you know. It's all personal preference. Right, right. Yeah. it's all personal preference, you know, and, 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 and your barn, to be honest, most bar timber frame barns, if you take care of them, they're going to last way beyond us. So, <laughs> way beyond that board and batten. Probably. Way beyond that board and board and batten. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we've covered all the questions in the chat and then some. So, I just want to thank Ian once again. Um, oh, one new message. Let me see what this is. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ian, once again, and for everybody for joining. Um, hope you got some of your questions answered. And we certainly are more than happy to um, accept email or give us a call if you have any other questions. As Ian had pointed out, we do have a, a big network. Of, New Hampshire is very fortunate to have a big network of timber framers who are experienced in these historic barns. So love they love to answer questions um, or help lead you in your evaluation or your repair. So feel free to reach out at any time. Um, and we do have a barn page on our website. So check that out too. Lots of great information there. So again, thank you all for joining and hope to see you at future Expo programs. Take care. Bye-bye everybody. everybody. Thanks, Ian. Thank